Um, I am Professor Philip Napoli. I am an associate, associate professor of history uh, and the interim dean of uh, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Brooklyn College. Welcome to our morning panel on history. Uh, um, I am delighted to be with you. Um, I want to begin our conversation this morning with a note of thanks. Um, I believe it's always important to, to express gratitude for the people who've done the organizational work to get us all in the room together. So my thanks first goes to Gaston Alonzo and the staff at the Wolf Institute for organizing everybody to be here, everybody on time, all of the gear is working. We're all grateful for, for that. And I um, uh, want to say thanks to the library and the library staff for their technical assistance and much more importantly for making us all welcome here this morning. So thank you uh, to, the, to the library. And finally, I want to say thanks to all of our students who are here. Um, I am grateful for your, for your being here and also grateful to your faculty for asking you to come. I'd like to do a couple of housekeeping bits um, as, I, as we get ready for this morning's panel. If you are a student um, and you did not sign in on the way in, please be sure to sign out as you walk out the door. This event is being live streamed and a recording of it will be posted on the Wolf Institute's YouTube channel. Um, toward the end of the event, we will be taking questions and comments related to the central theme of our conversation. So hold your questions until we get toward the end. There will be space for you to ask our panelists what you would like to ask. Um, the, I want to say now, and I will say again at the end of the event, I'm asking you to come back at 4.15 for the second of today's events. Defending the Freedom to Teach begins at 4.15 to, uh, today in this space. I also, let me say, uh, this is maybe a little out of order, thank you to the library, particularly for developing these library guides um, uh, to both the work of Paul Ortiz and to oral history. So if you wanted to find that library guide which points you to resources about our shared field, you would go to brooklyn.cuny.edu, library guides, brooklyn.cuny.edu, wolf 20, 2023, it's a tongue twister, oral history test week. Um, and that you will find uh, links to useful things there. For the benefit of uh, the audience, perhaps unfamiliar with oral history, I'd like to offer two definitions of the field um, as a starting place for our conversation this morning. According to the Oral History Association, of which Professor Ortiz is a past president, oral history refers to both the interview process, and process I underline, and the products that result from a recorded spoken interview, whether on audio, video, or in other formats. In order to gather and preserve meaningful information about the past, oral historians might record interviews focused on narrators' life histories or topical interviews, in which narrators are selected for their knowledge of a particular historical subject or event. Once completed, an interview, if it is to be placed in an archive, can be used beyond its initial purpose with the permission of both the interviewer and the narrator. And that is the definition according to our shared professional association. I'd like to offer a definition that I give to students as I introduce the field in my oral history courses. Um, I unfortunately don't get to teach as much as I might like. But this is shaped by my disciplinary home in history, and I will offer the opportunity to challenge my definition in just a moment. I would argue that oral history is a unique approach to studying the past. Um, it, has, it takes as its essential subject matter the present-day perspective, often known as subjectivity, of the interviewee and his or her understanding of the past. It explores the link between the past and the present, the connection between self and society, or the relationship between autobiography and history. Oral history is definitely interested in the things, in, in exactly what took place, but it is equally interested in what the events of the past mean now to our interviewee. In this way, it deals principally with the intersection of the present and the past, the way the past lives on in the present, using memory as our vehicle to create historical understanding. As a result, oral history is, in fact, an interdisciplinary field, despite my imperial claims. Right? 
It has much in common with sociology, with psychology, with anthropology, um, and journalism. But my position is likely to be different from that of our panelists, making this a proper jumping off place for introducing our panelists, each of whom will, uh, whom will offer their perspective on oral history and how they use it in their research. So first I would like to introduce the here Ali, Executive Director of the Hutchins Institute for Social Justice at the Lawrenceville School. Um, <laughs> Our very own Professor Naomi Schiller, who is a professor of anthropology at the college. <laughs> Our colleague Amy Starczewski, who is the director of the Oral History Master's Program at Columbia University. <laughs> and finally, our very special guest, Professor Paul Ortiz, professor of history and director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. <laughs> We've asked each uh, panelist to speak for between five and seven minutes. Um, I have some questions that I can, uh, after which I can start us off with a conversation, um, uh, and then we will open the floor to our audience. But we didn't determine a, an order for speaking. Would anyone care to volunteer to go first? Naomi, you're right next to me, and thank you very much, Professor Schiller. <laughs> so, um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the Wolf Institute, to Gaston Alonso, the incredible organizing that went into this just blows me away. I um, really appreciate to my fellow panelists, and it's such an honor and a privilege to be here with Paul Ortiz, whose work has been such a great inspiration. Um, so, I'm here today, um, yesterday actually, Paul um, said something like, you know, if you think some things need to change, then you really need to listen to people, right? Um, and I think particularly, I take from that, we really need to listen to people who have worked to make change, who agree with us that things need to change and have spent their lives trying to make change. How do we build on what they've learned, um, the failures that they've gone through, the victories, the lessons learned along the way? Not that we have to replicate what people who have come before us have done precisely, right? Um, but we need to hold on to those lessons and carry them forward and build on them. So as an anthropologist, I've mostly um, used oral history alongside long-term ethnographic fieldwork. So ethnographic fieldwork is one of the main methodologies that anthropologists use to understand people's lives. Sometimes we refer to it as deep hanging out, right? <laughs> we spend a lot of time um, participating with people so it's observant participation, and it's participatory observation, right? It's both. Um, so alongside this deep hanging out, um, many anthropologists conduct life history to try to place what we're observing and participating in alongside the, the ways that people narrate their lives, understand their own stories, to understand that one period that you might be participating in as, as an anthropologist within the broader life context. Right? Um, so this is true in the work that I did with community media activists and social movements in Venezuela in my first book. And it's true for the research that I'm doing on climate change adaptation in New York City in my own backyard in the Lower East Side. But my most recent project um, emerged out of um, social movement work that I was doing in my neighborhood alongside activists in my neighborhood and from groups across New York City um, who were fighting gentrification, um, fighting uh, what had happened in the previous 10 years. This, we were doing this work around 2018, 2019, during the uh, mayoral regimes of uh, Bloomberg and de Blasio, New York City upzoned many New York City neighborhoods, meaning that the height of buildings that, that developers could build was raised and many other things, but the end result was that uh, working class communities, largely working class communities of color, have been pushed out or displaced from their homes in many New York City neighborhoods. And I'm sure 
many of many of us have seen them in our various neighborhoods. So um, I was working with these different neighborhood activists um, to fight through to fight some of these developer efforts, um, and we reflected on so much of what activists had learned in the previous decade was uh, not being documented, um, and we were all really separated in our own little or organizing groups in our own neighborhoods, really disconnected from our broader movement um, to, around land use and housing, uh, for just land use and housing. Um, so the movement organizing that I was involved in really called out for, it begged the methodology of, for, of activist oral history. Um, so activist oral history really identifies the importance of deep listening and learning from other people, from each other, as a way to build a move movements for social change. Um, so, you know, we started talking about how there was so much wisdom, so much to learn uh, from the victories, from the failures, and everything in between. Um, so clearly that oral history could really be a way, and as Phil mentioned at the top, both as a product and a process, right? Because the process we recognize would be really critical to connect people and the product, the archive of oral histories that we would make public would, we would hope, be um, allow the, the broader city and world to learn from, from the system, right? So um, we designed actually an act, a participatory oral history project um, uh, that was collaborative and I built on the work that the um, Brooklyn Listening Project has done uh, developed by my colleague Jessica Siegel, Joseph Benton, Maddie Fox, and others, um, where we have tried, we've done these workshops for years trying to encourage our colleagues to build oral history into their classrooms as a way to learn from each other, to teach, to help students uh, to document and learn from the rich lives of their family members, their community members, their neighbors. Um, so I built on that, that experience and I did a skill sharing workshop um, alongside a collaborator named Vanessa Till, who's an artist and an activist, we brought together too many students. Um, and we brought together about 20 organizers from different neighborhoods around New York City who were involved in the same kind of anti-displacement organizing. And we paired people up from different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we had someone from the Voice of Gowanus, a group in Brooklyn, um, paired with someone from um, Inwood is Not For Sale in Upper Manhattan, someone from the Lower East Side with someone from a Western Queens Community Land Trust group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we had this skill sharing workshop where we talked about oral history. Um, I gave you know, a, a, a two hour workshop a couple of times to people to in basic oral history methods training. Um, and, then, and then we set people up, we kind of match made basically. Um, from different neighborhoods and people interviewed each other. First one person would go and be the interviewer um, and, and, and interview for about an hour based on a collective interview guide of questions that we developed together as, as a group in the workshop. So we talked about what do we need to know? What do we need to learn from each other? What do you most want to understand, right? Um, so, and then, so the, the interviewer would become the interviewee, or the narrator would become the narrator, depending on the language you want to use. Um, they would switch, right? And so we produced transcripts out of that. And, um, and it was um, really clear to me that we wanted to make these transcripts public, but the, the interviews were so rich, and we had CUNY um, Brooklyn College students, anthropology majors, working on the transcripts, uh, thinking them through, analyzing them, coding them. Um, it was so clear that the information was so rich that uh, my collaborator and I, Vanessa Till, decided to create a handbook for organizers um, about all these lessons. So we created this book, Disruptive Engagement, an Organizer's Guide to Building Community Power for Justice and Land Use and Housing in New York City. It's kind of a long subtitle. Um, but it uh, tries to distill the lessons that we learned um, <laughs> particularly around how activists disrupt and engage New York City's processes. So these are people who want to make serious change, right? They see huge problems in the way their resources are distributed um, in the city um, and the decision, who gets to make the decisions about where we live, how we live, why is housing a commodity to be bought and sold, why is housing treated as a right? Um, so we, um, so, but these people who are involved in this project, rather than just sort of wash your hands of it and walk away, right, saying the system is so beyond repair, forget about it, really wanted to engage, disrupt the, the processes for the decision making, both on the inside, so 
how do you go to an official public hearing and make, make a splash, interrupt in the most effective way possible, right? And how do you stand outside? Um, how do you protest outside? How do you get involved in direct action? How do you shut things down sometimes, right? Um, so we, we, we brought together all these lessons. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. Got a couple more minutes. OK. Um, so uh, let's see. I have lots of answers to your other questions. Um, I think um, you know, one thing I wanted to say is that there's so, to develop the project, you know, you don't have to create the wheel again, right? I built on the work of the Brooklyn Listening Project. I built on the incredible work of Amy's, um, the Oral History Master's Program that runs these incredible public um, open uh, Zoom sessions where I learned so much, right? There's so much to learn from in this city. I learned from um, the participatory action research a public science project that Maddie Fox, our colleague in sociology, um, is part of and runs these incredible. So there's so many resources. And I want to encourage, like, if there is a methodology you want to try out, right? Oral history is an incredibly powerful way to learn to listen. And there are so many resources out there to help you figure out how to do this, how to practice it. We can start in our classrooms. We can go out into our communities. We can go back and forth. Um, so I It's a 
about 50,000 people in about one square mile. It's one of the densest parts of one of the densest cities in America. But I would say it's not a community. It has a lot of communities in it, right? Um, around churches, blocks, buildings, schools, mosques, parks, family and friend networks, political and community and arts organizations. And some people are part of one or more of these communities. And plenty of people kind of keep to themselves, right? Just because you live in a place doesn't mean you're part of any particular community there. Uh, some people have been in the neighborhood for generations. Some are new to the neighborhood or new to this country or both. Um, it does not have a single public sphere. Uh, there's no single way to address or engage the public of Mott Haven. Um, and so I try to curate oral histories in a way that really builds on uh, rather than trying to overcome the traits that we love so much about them, that they're long, slow, deeply personal, messy. Um, and so this looks like uh, in-person listening parties in public spaces like community gardens with lots of time to chat and to eat. Um, it looks like in situ oral history banners uh, that connect images of the past um, with places in the present. So this is the banner that's up on this corner. And you can see the moment these are up, people stop to look at them, they stop to talk about them, they stop to point at them. Um, and they make connections between past, present, and future in a way that, that's experienced through people's bodies in places. Um, it also looks like sound walks. And this is one of the things I've been most excited about as a way to practice a relational public oral history. So the sound walks are done in pairs um, because that's a, a, a scale at which I feel like relationships can really be built. Uh, they take about an hour. One person's the guide and one person is being guided. Uh, but you listen at the same time together through headphones with a headphone splitter, so you're actually kind of wired together um, to the same edited montage of oral history clips. Um, sometimes they directly relate to the places that you're walking through and sometimes they're more just reflections on what it's meant to be in this neighborhood or just stories from people who live in the neighborhood. Um, and they deliberately juxtapose pretty different um, perspectives. And so the walk is actually only open to people who live or work in Mott Haven. We started off um, with me taking the people who are featured in the walk. Well, first I tried it with my sister, so that's the top <laughs> left. First I did it by myself, then I tried it with my sister. Uh, then I took the people whose audio is in the walk, um, and then they started being able to take, oh, that's funny, and then how that one got upside down. <laughs> it's a kaleidoscope. Okay. Um, they started to take people that they knew on the walk, and then we expanded it so that anyone um, who had been on the walk could take other people. So I took Olivia, um, and then Olivia started taking people that she knew and cared about in the neighborhood. Um, and so this project really has grown into and been the seed of the Mott Haven History Keepers. And this is the last piece of work that I'll share today. Um, so with the Mott Haven History Keepers, we brought together, with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, 10 people in the neighborhood who care deeply about the neighborhood's history, who remember stories, who collect old photos, um, who do that as part of their lives, as part of the neighborhood, um, but who aren't necessarily, or none of them are humanities workers, none of them are historians or professors, none of them work in archives, um, none of them are part of sort of the professionalized public humanities sphere, um, and the project basically just pays them to do whatever they want that matters to them as history keepers. Uh, we meet every month for different kinds of training, activities, experiences together. Um, we're working in some little pairs and dyads and triads. So uh, Sony, one of the participants, is interviewing Nieves Ayres, who's a longtime neighborhood activist, um, and helping her to go through her archive. Nieves is also one of the history keepers with the great hat in the middle here. Um, Leslie is learning from Walter, who's another one of the history keepers, who's a former young lord, how to do Tai Chi and acupressure, because one of his big contributions to the neighborhood's history was developing um, holistic ways to do drug detox work as a young lord. Uh, and so his way of keeping that history alive is by teaching those skills. Um, and as he's teaching the skills, he's telling the story. So here you can see 
Leslie working on his ears, someone else working on Leslie's ears. They do this every Saturday. And we walk around the neighborhood and show each other places that matter to us and tell about them. And we have a WhatsApp that is just on fire. So that's, the, that's what really makes me feel like this is work is working. Um, that people were constantly texting each other saying like, hey, look at this thing that I found, or does anybody know about this building? Um, the one on the left is, you know, there was a, a building that used to be a club, and people were ch chiming in like, oh, my mom used to go there, like, oh, I read this thing. Um, and really keeping the history alive and circulating through um, networks that exist and matter. Um, and so what this work really aims to do is to foster a sense of being part of a public in Mott Haven through engagement with oral history, through building communities of oral history practitioners, and through them connecting disparate communities and networks and helping them to learn each other's histories. Uh, so these are not all people who knew each other or who, you know, you can see they're like very different ages, different styles from different, different communities within our neighborhood. Um, so I really invite us to think of public oral history not as sharing oral history with the public, but as using oral history to weave people and communities into more powerful publics. Thank you. Stories are erased, 
especially their stories that connect them to a place. And so we set out with the Voices of Crown Heights project to document the stories that connected people to place. Um, and so that is um, a part of the methodological practice. We looked at histories of resistance and resilience. We looked at overlooked voices and labor by community residents. Um, we engaged in what we call counter-hegemonic mapping, which is a map from below, a map that challenges the map that's imposed on people by the stories that they tell. And so a street corner becomes something more because of the experiences people have there. A park becomes something different because of the experiences people have there. And people create their own map of a neighborhood. The third um, thing that I learned about oral history, so that you know we have the, the scholarship, the archival object, the methodological practice, and, and the ethical practice, is that oral history if you, if you really lean into oral history, you should become transformed by the practice, right? Um, and that is because of this deep um, and, and strong emphasis on listening. And so when we were doing the Muslims in Brooklyn project, and this is a project started in 2017, um, and, and you know, uh, to um, Phil's point about it, oral history documents both the past, but the moment in which the past is being remembered, so in 2017, um, this was there was this, you know Donald Trump was the president. There was the Muslim ban, um, and so that was again. How do you begin to displace or disconnect people from a place to erase their stories? Well, these were stories that hadn't even been recorded yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so that before we can erase deal with, deal with erasure, we have to deal with documentation. And the Muslims in Brooklyn project set out to document three things. One, the long history of Muslims in Brooklyn, in New York City, and the United States. Two, how diverse Muslims were, that they couldn't be profiled by any single demographic. And three, that Muslims were Brooklynites, that they had shaped Brooklyn as much as Brooklyn had shaped them. Um, and so in doing this work, uh, one of the things that happened is that in the midst of this project, the Supreme Court upheld the Muslim ban. And Brooklyn Historical Society, as an institution, um, issued a statement affirming the lives and presence of Muslims in Brooklyn. And this came out of our understanding that we couldn't just be doing this project in a sort of extractive, mercenary, let's enrich the social capital and academic capital of our archive by filling it with these stories that people haven't heard before. That we had this ethical commitment and obligation, right? to engage people as part of a community. And so that's what I mean, that if you engage in oral history, you have to be transformed. And so it was, the institution felt was, it was one of the few public cultural institutions in New York to issue a statement like that, right? Um, and I was really proud that we could do that. The last thing I'll talk about is uh, my work with artists. Um, and this is really leaning into the idea of listening. Um, Alessandra Tortelli, who is considered like one of the leading lights of the formal practice of oral history, of course, in the oral history is millennia old in many cultures, but formal practice, um, has this quote that I like, which is the essential art of the oral historian is the art of listening. And um, I have really leaned into this idea of listening, um, where we listen to learn, you know, this is the archival object, um, increase your knowledge. We listen to build our capacity through methodological practice. And um, we listen to nurture community, which is the ethical practice. And working with artists, um, I have you know, really focused on understanding that essential to storytelling is story listening. And that if you want, you know, they, this is why they say like good writers read, good storytellers listen. Right? Um, and so focusing on the work of listening as a creative act. That listening not only increases our knowledge, it builds our relationships, strengthens our relationships, and strengthens our practice. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the work in terms of scholarship. I had the um, fortune of teaching a summer class at the oral history program at Columbia, which allowed me to fine tune this idea of listening after the interview. Um, that oral history is something that we continue to do even after the recording has stopped. Um, and what does it look like listening after the interview? And listening, and I'll say for, for those of you who may never do an oral history interview, but you have to do research. Um, one of the most important things of oral history is that it it helps fill the silences in the archives of people whose lives are documented.
connect with people whose lives are not um, uh, are there. And I think of the work of Saida Hartman, who has a book called Wayward Lives, and she, in the intro, has this really wonderful meditation on how do you um, recover in full agency the lives of people who have been rendered on the margins in the archive or erased. I think of the work of Hugh Ryan, who's done a lot on uh, queer histories in Brooklyn and in New York, um, and having to look at um, hostile sources and retrieve out of hostile sources human beings, right? Um, and so oral history asks us to listen. Not just listen to what is said, but what is not said. When you're interviewing someone, the silence is just as important as what is spoken. And so when you're listening to an archive, pay attention to what is not said. Who are the ghosts in the room? Who are the people that are present who are not documented, right? Um, what are the social structures that people are responding to that they may not be able to articulate in an oral history or even in an archive, right? What are the systems that are impacting people? What are the policies that are impacting people? These are all things we do as part of that methodological practice of oral history. We listen for what isn't there, but that is present, right? Um, the, you know, someone may be talking about their experience with racism, but never use that word, right? Um, similarly, an archive may represent a certain kind of inequality, but never name it, right? And so that's the key to listening. Um, listening asks us to use questions uh, and we do this with oral history, as a guide, not an anchor, right? As a, as a question that leads you, but doesn't hold you back. So when you set out to do your research work and you're researching in an archive or you're doing a research project, yes, it's good to have a question like, here's what I'm interested in, but be open to the unexpected encounter. Oral history is filled with the unexpected encounter, stories we did not anticipate hearing, um, and then we hear it, it's like, go. <laughs> right? And that's the value of listening because you you give people space to meditate on what they're saying. You don't just jump right into your next question. And that's why your questions are a guide, not an anchor. Um, think about history and historiography. We've talked a little bit about that. The difference between um, what is what has happened and the moment in which what has happened is being remembered. And when you look at your archive and you're doing research, the archive represents something that has been documented, but the archive itself has its own story, right? So like when we were doing research on Malcolm X, the FBI clocked him on a daily basis. It was very helpful <laughs> to, <laughs> to know where he was, who he was talking to, and, and where he was. However, the FBI had a function and had a purpose, right? That, that there's, a, there's a meta reading of the archive that oral history encourages to do. And then finally, think about the dialogic process. Um, when, it, when you hear an oral history, whether the interviewer is present on the recording or not, the interviewer is there. Whether you hear in a curated oral history clip the question that was asked, there was a question, right? And so when you enter into doing work as researchers, um, know that you are bringing yourself into a conversation with your subject, and that the subject that results will be a unique product of your encounter with it. And just like, we could all do the same, like interview the same, we could all interview Paul, and all of our interviews would be slightly different, right? We could interview, I could interview Paul today and interview Paul tomorrow, they would be slightly different. The encounter that you have with your subject is unique, and as you do your research, so it, so it is. So um, I think I'll stop there for our questions. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Paul. Because I'm the last speaker again, I have to. I've been, you know, I've heard, heard you on work, and I love uh, teachers' practice where they will say, hey, get up and stretch now. We've been sitting for about an hour. Uh, so if you feel like getting up and stretching, I won't be offended. Or even standing at the back. I'm, I'm the person, by the way, who usually has to do that, get up and stand in the back. But, so what I'd like to do this morning, and I love everything my dear colleagues have, have said about oral history. I've taken a lot of notes 
I, I continue to learn so much. And I also wanted to address when Bill started this off with some really brilliant questions about oral history. And I want to address the disciplinary um, uh, point that, that Bill uh, wisely brought up. And for me, I'll just continue to build on what I said yesterday. Um, oral history was my pathway to becoming your Hess scholar of 2023, 2024. It was the only pathway open to me uh, to get into higher education. Because again, where I came from, uh, our people did not go to college. Uh, our parents could not help us with our homework. We were expected to go into the military. You know, and that, that, that was really it. Or you know, manual trades or service work. So I mentioned yesterday that um, I really liked that. I had a great high school English teacher who introduced me to bad books. And that really saved my life intellectually because I was able to read Richard Wright, Sylvia Platt, um, Ralph Ellison as a high school senior. It was just incredible. Uh, and so that kind of really woke me up intellectually. And then I mentioned uh, when I left, got out of the military, came back from uh, U.S. Special Forces in Central America, I took a history course, a series of history courses with Professor Phil Schaefer at Olympic College, and Phil taught me really how to be a historian. And that continued when I transferred to the Evergreen State College in 1988, and I studied with Stephanie Kuntz, who I still believe, outside of Brooklyn College, is the best historian in the country. <laughs> um, so they taught me really, uh, Stephanie and, and Phil taught me how to kind of carry myself as a historian, how to go to the sources, um, how to, to balance things out, really how to, how to be a scholar. And then I ended up at Duke University in 1993, and how I ended up there was quite um, interesting. It was, it was to work, um, and it was to work on a National Endowment for Humanities funded project called Behind the Veil, documenting African American life in the Jim Crow South. And if you've seen the, the, the display out there, uh, one of the results, one of the many outcomes of that project was a book uh, called Remembering Jim Crow. But that was my pathway into higher education. And the NEH and Duke and uh, other foundations designed that project. And my advisor, Bill Chafe, my dissertation advisor, designed that project and Larry Goodwin and other people uh, to get people like me into the academy, you know, working class kids, to become oral historians. And I think it was really quite revolutionary in many ways. We didn't know it at the time, we took it for granted. But inviting working class people into colleges and universities um, can be a revolutionary thing because we bring insights and expectations and, and experiences that don't normally get uh, air on, on college or university campuses. Uh, for one thing, we're raised with, with a lot of dislocation. Uh, I remember, um, as I hear you use from ghosts, and one of the kind of the movement interviews I did leading up to the 2006 general strike was with a union leader, a custodian at UC Santa Cruz, very militant, and she said, you know, Professor Ortiz, we really appreciate you coming out and speaking in favor of the unions, but isn't it interesting that you only talk with us during strikes? <laughs> Normally, we're the ghosts who clean. That's what she said. You don't see our labor in keeping, you know, as much as you sympathize with us, it's very, um, very just, we're the ghosts who clean. So my pathway to becoming a scholar was through this project behind the veil documenting African American life in the Jim Crow South. As a grad student at Duke University, I spent way more time doing field work than I did in any graduate seminar. In fact, I should say this in front of my colleagues, but I actually skipped a lot of graduate seminars <laughs> to do field work. And that gets me to my disciplinary point about anthropology and ethnography because as the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida, um, a lot of our students over the years have been anthropologists. And People like Justin Dunavant, who's now an assistant professor in anthropology at UCLA, and one of the, the founders of the African American uh, Underwater Archaeology uh, uh, Association. People like Justin Posby, who's um, an anthropologist at UC Berkeley right now. But the fieldwork aspect of it, again, draws on my working class roots, because in some, in some cases, being a working class person 
and colleges and universities that still can be kind of alienated. And so oftentimes when I was in grad school, people, my peers or even my professors would sometimes say, where's Paula? Well, I had the parents' excuse note signed by my dissertation advisor, Bill Chase, to do interviews in the rural South, right? And I was part of this NEH project. And getting out in the field and interviewing African-American elders, because that was really the focus of the project, the theme was interview African-American elders about life in the Jim Crow South before the Civil Rights Movement, what that meant. And it was, uh, in some cases, shocking, in some cases, affirming. Um, I grew up, my father's generation of, of Mexican-Americans, of, of Latinx people, they grew up, when we grew up in Houston, there were signs that you had to look at that said, you know, no Mexicans, no Negroes, no dogs allowed in this establishment. And as a kid, I grew up hearing that. And we, you know, we dealt with racism as kids, but I was born in 1964. I didn't have to look at that kind of sign. Okay? And so going to the Deep South and interviewing African-American elders about what they had to deal with was just very, it was eye-opening. Um, it was, it was really affirming in many ways. One of the things I would ask parents, people who had been parents, how did you raise your children with a sense of, of dignity? Because as a parent, that's like your number one job, right? Mm -hmm. But how can you do that when you have these horrific signs? White, black, color, you know. And um, because the sign is designed to take your dignity from you and to teach you that you don't have dignity. And one of the things that African-American parents would tell me was, we would, as much as we possibly could, make sure that our children did not come in contact with white individuals as parents. Because we knew that once, and we knew eventually they would have to come in contact with white people as employers, et cetera, et cetera. But as, as long as we could, we keep them sheltered from having to deal with that kind of um, humiliation and insults of what it meant to grow up in a Jim Crow society. And that was really profoundly educational for me as an oral historian. As I started teaching oral history as a grad student at Duke and also at NC State, um, one of the things, and, and Zahir mentioned Alessandro Fratelli, and being able to learn from people like Amy Starczewski, Alessandro, Naomi Zahir has been a great experience, and now Phil. So one of the things I learned as an oral historian in teaching is we do work in communities, and we're expected to do that kind of work. When I was a grad student, and then when I became a junior professor, it was made clear to me that as an oral historian, my job, whatever institution I taught at, was to be the bridge between the surrounding community and the campus. Why? Because the campus, whatever campus it was, University of Florida, Duke, UC Santa Cruz, somehow had poor relations with the surrounding community. Why was that? Well, as a working class person, I can tell you, exploitation. Okay? Labor exploitation, number one. And then we'll just start there and you can go down. I won't bore you with the other ones. So oral historians were the people who would go out into the community and talk to people, not to study them, but to learn from them. Because my God, we spend so much time, if, if you read, you know, as a labor historian, I love reading like old archival, you know, studies like the Pittsburgh survey or the social work survey at Columbia did in working class communities and best buy, et cetera, et cetera. And there's hundreds of thousands of pages of studying of, you know, in the questions that social workers would ask the community. And this is the kind of vibe that I grew up with in a working class community. We have social workers come to our community asking questions all the time. Why do you have so many children? Uh, why is your diet like this? You know, why do you do this? And young, generally Anglo individuals who are well-meaning, but whose questions humiliate our mothers especially. Because it was our mothers who usually had to answer the questions. The fathers found ways to avoid those questions usually. Oftentimes it would be at the mill or, or whatever the case may be. But kind of thinking about, you know, wrapping up here, I think that
trauma is one of those topics in oral history that we've gotten a little better with dealing with. And again, working class perspectives really help us deal with those things. One of the, the amazing projects we've been doing in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program since um, 2019 is we're invited to Elaine, Arkansas by the community there to work with them on doing interviews and, and work on the legacies of the 1919 Elaine Massacre, a massacre that the federal government of this country was involved in, uh, that wealthy plantation owners were involved in, where they murdered hundreds of African-American sharecroppers and farm workers. It was a racial pogrom. The purpose was to drive land-owning black farmers out of the upper Arkansas Delta in 1919. So as a student, I had read about this massacre, but I never could have imagined in my wildest dream I would be interviewing people about the massacre. Not people who were there during the time, because they've all passed away, but their descendants, or people who live in Arkansas that may not even be connected to the massacre, but we're all connected to the Elaine Massacre, by the way. It was done by our government, okay? So we all have a connection to that. And trying to talk to communities there about, I mean, what I love about oral history, and this kind of echoes things that Amy said, is it pushes us into these unscripted moments where I'll tell my students at the beginning of a class when I'm teaching oral history, or when I take them to the Mississippi Delta, the Arkansas Delta, oral history doesn't have safe spaces. Like all of the things we talked about in the seminar where we're being respectful of each other, we listen to each other. When we go out into the field, all bets are off. Like I cannot, I cannot guarantee you that the person you're talking with or the community that you're talking with is going to make you feel welcome or comfortable, right? In fact, you probably will feel very uncomfortable. When we rolled into the Arkansas Delta this past summer, we rolled into communities that had not had potable water for six months. Yeah. And you go into a McDonald's, you, you couldn't order coffee, you couldn't order soft drinks. I mean, that's just kind of the, the surface thing. And my students were like, why? And I would think, my job as a teacher is finished here. Because now you can talk to people and ask them why a state with a $1.5 billion budget surplus cannot provide potable water to its citizens and why the media wasn't talking about it. But that's the great thing about oral history. Again, field work, anthropology, sociology, history, all these things coming together. Um, the very last thing I probably will mention. So the last project that we're working on, and now as I transition to um, Cornell, this is one of the things we're going to do with Brett leaving UF, is we're interviewing descendants of the Underground Railroad, people who are freedom seekers or conductors, through the National Park Service. And it's amazing to talk to people, some of whose ancestors wrote these incredible memoirs about their odysseys and journeys to freedom, other people who didn't have ancestors who wrote those types of things. But again, the oppositional consciousness is so amazing. I interviewed uh, Bob Seeley, whose, whose ancestor was Thomas Garrett. Thomas Garrett worked with Frederick Douglass and other people and helped free hundreds of enslaved African Americans from slavery. And I asked him what he thought about the U.S. Supreme Court. And you're not going to read anything about his perspective on the U.S. Supreme Court in the U.S. history textbook because for much of Thomas Garrett's life, the U.S. Supreme Court, especially Supreme Court Justice Taney, went after him, tried to destroy him, bankrupt him. So if you tell Bob Seeley that the Supreme Court has got checks and balances, don't do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> wow, what an hour. Um, I have, you know, it's all part of my education, and I'm really grateful for it everybody's uh, contributions here. We've listened to people tell us about how to use oral history as a tool for social change, from Professor Schiller to Professor uh, Skarczewski telling us about how we can use oral history to create, um, to, to shape and move communities. Um, uh, 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 Professor Zahir has told us about 
the way we can use oral history as an ethical practice for inclusivity. Um, and, 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 and Paul, of course, has talked to us about how oral history can be an entryway into all kinds of things, but not least of which is community, um, and in which communities you may feel uncomfortable. Um, speaking as a white guy who interviews veterans, let me tell you about how uncomfortable one can feel. I, got, I have to write a paper this week for delivery next week on exactly this topic. I'd like to start with one question and then open the floor. Um, I'd like to add, and throw this out to anybody who wishes to answer. Um, how have you been transformed by the practice of oral history in your research? Personally been transformed. Anybody want to take that one up? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> I mean, I, I can, I can uh, try to say something in response to that. I think um, the practice of oral history and the way that I've been doing it has really changed me in terms of being open to more different ways of working and working with other people and realizing um, that the ways that feel comfortable to me in terms of communicating, passing on knowledge, um, like uh, just has, I think being trained as an anthropologist helps with this, but um, being willing to just hang out and spend time um, as opposed to being like, here's our appointment, but this is our agenda, we're going to do this thing, um, and then we're done, and then we're going to move on. Um, I think I've really changed in that way. Or I'm on a journey of changing, because I still do love appointments and agendas, but I recognize, <laughs> I recognize the limitations of that approach in, at a very deep level. Thank you. Does anybody else want to chip in on this topic? Uh, I think um, it's helped me put professionalization in context. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when I like went to college, I thought that you know there was a kind of authority that comes with studying and getting a graduate degree or whatever, um, and that that authority granted some expertise um, that is almost automatically respected. Mm -hmm. um, and with oral history, you know, we talk about this thing of shared authority, um, and I think it's helped me be able to articulate to myself. Um, a respect for different kinds of knowing, different ways of knowing, and different ways of talking about knowing, um, especially from uh, people who are not credentialed, um, who are not acknowledged, um, whose voices are not uh, conventionally respected. Um, you know, sitting with someone, um, and especially when you're doing it really well, uh, and, and that takes work and practice. My first oral histories were terrible. <laughs> um, they weren't bad, but they were not that good. Um, but, you know, sitting and, and really sitting at the foot of someone and, and, and creating as a listener, setting the table and in, in invitation, eliciting, affirming, encouraging, all of the things that you do to get someone to feel comfortable to... Um, do something that they probably haven't, you know, especially people who haven't done it before, right? Like, there's a difference when you interview, like, a public figure who's used to telling a story, and sometimes there's authenticity questions there. But, and, and with everyone, everyone is fabric, mm -hmm. everyone is fashioning their story. Mm -hmm. um, everyone. Mm -hmm. But especially with people who have not had the chance to do that, um, and you almost see in, in the process um, a sense of, agency and authority come to life, um, that people take great pride um, and, and assume a great pride in their story. And that's just deeply, deeply transformative uh, in terms of respecting different ways of knowing. Um, I think, you know, in addition to what you both just said, um, there's something really profound about listening to yourself interview someone, like listening afterwards, um, and recognizing um, how you're constantly learning and how your your own ignorance and learning is sort of threaded through that, to be able to reflect on, um, wow, why didn't I ask that follow-up question? What was going on for me? What didn't I understand about what they were telling me? Why wasn't I able to listen in that moment deeply enough to know what I needed to ask next. Um, or, you know, 
you're you're um, you're both learning anew from the person that you actually sat with and interviewed, and then you're really reflecting on yourself and your process and your own journey. So I think that's been really transformative. And I also think that um, learning from activists that I've interviewed um, over the course of my career in different moments in my life has also helped me to pivot from sort of the deep listening to the deep speaking out <laughs> um, and sort of helped me to be brave um, to understand the risks that people have taken in their lives and how they've done that and how they've thought about that. I think I've really um, learned so much from that, you know, and just yesterday, you know, hearing Paul talk about uh, confronting fascism in Florida, um, people speaking out about um, Israel's genocide in Gaza, um, to my colleagues last night at the Board of Trustees talking about community management's overreach. I see people speaking out all over the place, and I think there is a deep connection between really listening to people and then being able to speak. So I think that's been transformative. Well, I think for me, as a, as a quote, that's like, <laughs> um, as a teacher, you know, as teachers and professors, we're often asked to be experts, or it's assumed that if you, you know, you take us for a class, we kind of know what we're talking about, hopefully, um, but being a world historian has allowed me to, you know, Zahir mentioned, there's this really seminal piece in the World History Association, and the other thing for me, transformation, I'll say, that's been trans. It's just been making friends. Like we're all friends in oral history. Like oral, I'm in a lot of different history associations. <laughs> talk, you share and Jessica, etc. Um, but going to an oral history conference is just a joy because you can kind of let your hair down, <laughs> and it's like a community of people. If even if we are university based and privileged, um, we're always the most underfunded. Uh, program, we always have to hustle for money, right, Amy? Um, but I think for me, the biggest personal transformation, getting back to this whole shared authority thing, is being able to realize I'm not the authority. I don't have to be the expert, like on any topic. And I tell folks, whatever, if they're a grad student, undergrad, or a professor, or, or whatever, they want to do oral history, I tell them my own experience, which is that when I leave campus to do an oral history interview, I leave my professor's cap, I put it in the closet, and I leave it there, and then I leave campus and do my interview. Because I'm there, again, to, to learn from people. I'm not there to study them. Uh, it, it's a very different kind of, and, and I've read a lot of interviews between social workers and working class people. And again, I, I, I just think about that as a kid, hearing a young white social worker interrogate my own mother about you know, being a single mother, trying to raise two kids on a, a, a poverty wage, and just how, how heartbreaking it was and how degrading it was. So as a world historian now, I have a chance to, to do something different. And, um, but because of that prior history, it makes what we do challenging. Because I tell my students, you are not going to be the first person to do an oral history project wherever you go. I don't care how remote you, you think the part of the world you're going to interview in, there will be someone who preceded you, right? So by giving up the authority and not being the expert, it's liberating. Uh, but it's also a little frightening because we are training grad school to be the experts. But you realize that's not how we repair the world we live in. And the last thing I'll say is a military veteran who has seen people die up close to do these interviews with veterans and civilians. And I remember one of the first oral history interviews I did, Phil, with a military veteran, and I, I know you'll, you've had this experience, is you know, having a veteran tell me directly from, from uh, I think, the, the US War in Korea, our war will never end. As long as there's any people left alive in Korea that were subjected to what we did to them in Korea, which was the largest mass bombing in human history up to that point, as long as there's as long as those civilians who survived that war are, are alive, that war continues. The trauma, the effect. 
effects. As long as we veterans are alive, the war will continue, whether it's in Korea, Vietnam, or Gaza. That's the thing that people don't understand about war, is that the trauma will continue to live on and on and on. And that's one of the gifts of oral history. It's a reminder that memory is very crucial. What we do now, the impact of what we do now is going to have consequences for the rest of our lives and on to the next generations. And that's why oral history makes some people, I think, feel uncomfortable. And especially the veterans' history has really opened us into that realization. the beauty of this is that I'd love to have this conversation go on for the next couple of hours. I want to throw the uh, floor open. I see a hand pop up way at the back in the, on my right. Can, can we get, is it oh, Professor Jay? Yes, I, hi. Thanks everyone for the beautiful panel, Paul. Welcome. So thank you. But I want to ask Professor Amy about your um, history makers. Uh, just as a technique, I guess, how did you find them? How did you corral them? These all individual people from different <laughs> yeah. community groups. Um, and that's one, uh, one of the questions that uh, Dr. Napoli told us that he might ask is like, what is a, a failure you've experienced and what did you learn from it? And I think um, one thing I've learned through some like failed outreach in the past is that in this kind of situation, you have to think more like a community organizer than like a person making an event. Um, and so we reached out very, very broadly from, you know, the borough president putting notifications in their newsletter to flyering to going door to door talking to churches and community centers to doing outreach through like many different layers of networks and so some of the people are people that I knew before some of them are people who I had no relationship with who like saw a flyer in a coffee shop or saw a flyer at the public library um, yeah so it was it was the outreach we, I think we did outreach for like two solid months. Um, and then we had a very, very simple application form. Um, but we also said you could like fill out this Google form that just says like, why do you want to do this basically and tell us something about yourself. Or you could also just call and chat with one of us so that people who aren't into filling out Google forms are included. And then we had conversations with probably 40 people. Um, who were interested to get a sense of what a group of 10 that would work well together might look like. So we tried to make it as broad and as non-bureaucratic as we could. Thank you. Amy, Bobby's got a question. That's me. I do have a question for all of you guys. In a world where, you know, right-wing populism is, is a threat, it's coming to as a threat, I have to say that this is a. What are you? Okay, I I I I've got a question. I got a question for all of you. What inspired you to take these subjects? Mm -hmm. Good question. Naomi, why don't you? Sure. Um. Well, so the project that I just did, um, you know, really came out of the organizing work that I was involved in. So as I said, it, it sort of called out to me that it really ne needed documentation. We needed to have both the process of people talking to each other across the city, um, and we needed the product. So um, in, that, in that case, it was very much about what I was already involved in and, and, and a need that, that my I saw and my comrades saw about how we could connect and learn from one another. So that sort of emerged rather organically in that case. And I, I can say I live in Mount Haven. I've lived there for 25 years. And also my grandparents live there, my great grandparents. So I have deep roots in that place. And as I was thinking about a place where I wanted to do, where I wanted to invest my time, I just felt like if the focus was on relationships, then a place where I lived, it was more likely to to succeed in doing that work. Um, it's also a place that has very uh, like globally prominent historical narratives about it, both positive as a birthplace of hip hop culture um, and also negative arson, disinvestment, abandonment, um, the sort of like global, you know, people call like bad neighborhoods all over the world, the Bronx. Um, it's, like a, it's like a generic term for a, a bad neighborhood. 
Um, and so I think it's a, like the sort of meta research uh, that I'm interested in is how narratives about places circulate between professionalized and non-professionalized spheres. And so because these are such big narratives, I feel like it's a really interesting place to, to think about that question. Um, I think um, just addressing the silence in the archives, the, the scholarship in the late 90s and early 2000s on Malcolm had reached such a stale place mm -hmm. because they were all mining the same sources. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, the scholarship on Muslims in America um, was recycling the same narratives over and over and over again. And, and in part, that was you know, the limitation of what people had available for them in the archives. And so, um, but for example, the Muslims in Brooklyn project, those oral histories are, 55 of them are now archived and available in the, the Brooklyn Public Library Center for, for Brooklyn History. Um, and it's situated alongside other oral histories of Crown Heights, of you know, different subjects. Um, so they're not siloed, they're not separate, they're very much integrated into the archive. And so part of um, understanding knowledge production is to change the sources that people are, and, you know, add to the sources that people use. And so the hope is 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or even today, a young kid going into the library will find voices that they can connect with or that they can learn from. Paul, I'd like to give you the last okay, word. Okay, yeah, well, I'd love the question and the foregrounding with right-wing populism and the Underground Railroad Project, for me, and especially for my students, is such a great project to embark upon during this time of right-wing populism because, you know, the Underground Railroad is probably the most important social movement in U.S. history. And it's the one we know probably the least about. And but it's, it wasn't a left right wing thing. It was a freedom thing. If you believe in freedom, you got involved. You risked your life to be part of the Underground Railroad. If you were caught by the authorities, um, you could be incarcerated the rest of your life, you could be lynched. And so the chance to talk to descendants, for me, that's why it's so exciting because it's like, wow. And, and a lot, of, I read a lot about the Underground. A railroad, but to talk to descendants and to find out the knowledge they had and how it impacted the trajectory of their families to find out that they had an ancestor, her ancestors who fought for freedom in the 1810s, 20s, or 30s. Uh, one story, I'll just share one story. I have to, I have to share the story. I won't let you take the mic from me. But um, so, so the story I want to share with you, and I just, this is a plot spoiler because this will come out. The National Park Service will be starting to air these interviews next year. But one of the stories, a descendant um, whose parents, well, I have to tell you, it's William and Ellen Craft, their incredible odyssey, those of you who know their, their narrative, there's actually a Hollywood movie being made about the Craft family. And they escaped from slavery through Macon, Georgia in the 1840s. And just an incredible odyssey north to freedom. Um, but what I, and I knew that story, I learned in grad school, but what I didn't know was that their descendant, the person that me and my grad students interviewed just last year, was a organizer with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 60s who, who did her work, guess where? Macon, Georgia, in voter registration work and freedom school work. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is just too amazing. You know, that your, your ancestors fled from slavery from this place and you came back over a century later and fought for freedom again. So, I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, that's why I love oral history. I'm, I'm biased. I'm afraid we're out of time. I, like, allow me um, to say one thing um, to the students here. I think you've heard from all of us that what's great about oral history, and there are many great things, but one really great thing is you get to be a, 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 a lifelong learner, a permanent student if, when, when you do this work. Last thing. Please remember to attend the event at 415 in this space, Defending the Freedom to Teach. Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, and Paul Ortiz will be joined by educators, activists, and lawyers for a discussion of the current political and ideological attacks on K-12 
and college teachers freedom to teach. Thank you so much for being here.